Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's Gresham Symposium on uh, Conflict Resolution, um, distressingly a very um, topical and common theme in the modern world. Um, this afternoon, we want to uh, address the topic as a good symposium from a variety of angles. Um, our speakers will have 30-minute slots, and after the break, during which I'm afraid we shan't be offering any refreshments, because if we do, you never come back. Um, our speakers will be forming a panel, and we will have an opportunity for questions and discussion uh, in the audience. Um, it is a complex topic, as I expect we'll discover. Uh, the world has hopefully moved on from world wars, intercontinental wars, wars fought with the latest technology by major armies, to, regrettably, bushfire wars, civil wars, border conflicts, and ethnic disputes, to mention just a few. The underlying question is how to get warring factors to come face to face after years of conflict, though I rather fear we won't come to an answer this afternoon, much as we would like to. Um, reasons for conflict can be many and various, based on territory, autonomy, types of governance, borders and resources. Historic grievances, colonial legacies, ethnic differences can all play their part, and at times it's hard for the uninformed outsider to understand quite what the undercurrents are and why differences can cause such friction, suspicion, animosity and downright hostility. Now, you might have noticed in my first paragraph my use of Roger's thesaurus. Um, interesting, because actually I did go to the thesaurus to look up conflict versus dispute, and all sorts of interesting words came up. And if you reflect on them, um, there's an awful lot that could be said about almost any of those particular words. So they might sound like a list, but they are there for a particular purpose. Now, what we might want to consider are what the chances are of successful mediation in a country like Syria today. Whether a civil administration can ever be able to take charge of uh, Congo. Uh, can Somalia, Congo, hmm, can Somalia ever be brought back into the international fold? And what are the chances for the Afghan government when Western forces retire? Speculation is fruitless, forward planning may fail. However, it's not really possible to come to any conclusion while the conflicts are ongoing, and it might take more than one go over a lengthy period of time before a viable long-term solution can be put in place. The deep-rooted nature and undying hostility caused by civil war may, however, be studied from a historical perspective and the benefit of hindsight if we look at the case of Spain. Now, one reason why I do this is I check to make sure that none of the other speakers are going to talk about Spain. Because at one symposium, I enthusiastically said all the things I wanted to say about the subject. And the key speaker then stood up and said, as Professor Connell has just said, and she prefaced every remark with, as Professor Connell reminded us, and as Professor Connell very aptly said, so I'm going somewhere completely different, Spain 1936, fairly advanced European country, schools, hospitals, prestigious and ancient universities. The government wasn't in the hands of dissident tribesmen. The country had not been afflicted by years of drought or plagued by natural disaster. And yet, the hatred was never far below the surface. I sometimes rather fear it's almost latent to this day. And the outbreak of war was marked by atrocities which were committed by both sides. The war went on for three years, but it's only recently we've heard of the enormous number of massacres which took place, perpetrated largely by the forces of General Franco. We know now as a deliberate policy, but the Republicans were far from innocent in this respect. Um, a map of Spain and the different dots indicate mass graves which have been discovered in recent years. I say discovered because, in fact, most of these have been reported by um, people who lived through the Civil War years and the aftermath. Um, tremendous desire on the part of people to tell the truth before it was too late, and also modern DNA techniques succeeded in identifying quite a lot of the remains. Now, the present centre-right government has withdrawn financial support for this particular project, 
and an act passed by the previous socialist government called the Historic Memory Law, which was an attempt to recognize the, recognize the events of the war years, has um, gone into uh, abeyance. It was controversial because it challenged the so-called Pacto de Olvido, the agreement on both sides after Franco died that nobody would inquire too much into what anybody else had done. And since it's quite clear now that both sides had very bloodied hands, that probably suited people at the time, because there was an amnesty law passed in 1977, and which in fact is um, still in force today. Um, this event, I think, is an interesting contrast to the attempts and peace and reconciliation which we've seen elsewhere, led particularly perhaps in South Africa by Desmond Tutu and others. Now, some idea of the feeling of terror engendered by civil war, again coming from Spain, are the topos. A topo in Spanish, as you all well know, is a mole. And these are the people who hid in attics, outhouses, caves, anywhere where they thought they might be safe for anything up to 40 years. A lot of them, and we're talking about dozens, didn't come out because they didn't believe that Franco had died. Some people didn't believe that the old sod could die, actually, but that's another story. And it wasn't until the first democratic elections took place in 1977 that these people actually came out into the open. Now, what is it that makes you hide for nearly 40 years? That's a whole lifetime. Gives you some idea of not only the horror of the Civil War itself, half a million dead, quarter of a million refugees, 300,000 people in prison camps, the usual sort of stuff, and the systematic annihilation, as General Franco quite openly said, of the people who do not think like us. He was a simple soul, was Franco, but it's a simple ideology, only five words, but there we are. Now we could argue that took place a long time ago, but then we haven't even got on to Colombia, Chile, and Argentina. Three sophisticated, advanced countries full of extremely nice people. That's just the Spanish-speaking world, as you can see where I spent a lot of my working life. Um, but they've had more than their fair share of dictatorship, repression, and civil war, and that's just in my adult lifetime. Now, oh, let me tell you a little bit about the pictures. Um, the one on the right, obviously, is Goya, the disasters of war, 1808. Gives you some idea that these things are not just recent. The one on the left, curiously, is the British war artist Mervyn Peake, better known as a poet, better known as the author of Gormenghast, but he was used during the war, um, and he was one of the first artists to enter <coughs> to enter the Belsen concentration camp. And one of the things it's thought, which probably led to his later mental breakdown. But curious, I'm sure the picture on the left was based on Goya on the right, but I've always been very impressed with Mervyn Peake as a draftsman. Now, conflicts can even arise in countries with a long period of apparent peace or tranquility. Yugoslavia will be coming up in topics this afternoon, and Yugoslavia under Marshal Tito is perhaps a case in point because for many years people assumed that it was a settled, perhaps slightly repressive to the outside eye, but not quite the same as other countries in the Warsaw Pact. The Arab Spring arose because of the build-up of tension which was caused by years of repression. How much the internet and the use of social media led to the outburst of popular frustration and anger has yet to be studied. And then, of course, the sudden removal of controls can create a vacuum as in Libya, or uncertainty as to what should replace the former regime, as in Egypt. Yet transition is possible. You've seen that map of war graves. You've heard about the moles in Spain. The Franco regime was not terribly nice. It had a fairly human face from the late 50s onwards. But the Spaniards showed that a model transition to democracy could take place, a process well worth studying. Paul Preston at London School of Economics, who's one of the great writers of modern Spain, has done a book on this fairly recently, well worth reading because it can be done. And it was done so successfully that the model was followed by other Latin American republics when they emerged from 20 years of military dictatorship in the early 1980s. The Berlin Wall came down, most of the Eastern European states modernized, merged into a free market economy with relatively little friction and without violence. But the breakup of the Soviet Union was perhaps less successful. The trigger here, I think, is to change the ground rules. Decolonization took place a long while ago now, although some of the difficulties caused by colonial rules, such as 
boundaries which don't fit with a local ethnic mix may still be present today. There may have been points uh, in the past, in colonial times, with movements of population. Fiji or Sri Lanka might be cases in point. Changes in the post-war, decisions taken, taken early in the Cold War, may also have had an impact, the division of Vietnam or Korea being prime examples. Both these cases also indicate the extent to which the balance of power has changed, even in the nuclear age. Client wars were once fought between countries with backing from the superpowers, who vied with each other for control of countries by bloc, something which is perhaps less apparent now, particularly with the rising tension in the Far East, with a small country like North Korea defying both its key and one ally, China, and its historic enemy, America, with its own nuclear program. Nuclear proliferation, of course, is not the key question here today, though, Valerie, it would make a very good subject for a symposium. Um, what is significant is the emergence of asymmetric warfare, with the greater availability of modern weapons and the ability of guerrilla forces to pin down conventional armies, something which the Afghans demonstrated as far back as the 1920s and 1930s as anyone who's read the works of John Masters will realise. Nobody did, obviously, in the Ministry of Defence. Yet there are factors which perhaps are new. Rapid population growth, which puts pressure on habitable land areas, natural resources, and space for agriculture, and even access to water supplies. It's even possible that we'll see both the food weapon and the water weapon being wielded by particular countries within the foreseeable future, whether or not climate change has an impact. With regard to natural resources, there's increasing demand for raw materials to feed the new brick and civet economies. You've all heard of the BRICS. You may not have heard of Colombia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, and Turkey, who are thought to be the next round of BRIC countries in the next 15 to 20 years. That, in turn, creates competition not only to control border areas where particular resources can be found. We often forget that Peru and Ecuador fought a war as far back as 1944 for control of oil resources in border areas in South America. And of course, the political question arises as to how you distribute more widely, perhaps more fairly, the wealth that the exploitation of mineral resources can create. Now, a number of strategies have been devised by a coalition of organizations, mainly rooted through the UN, as a means of providing a basis of legality on which to proceed in times of difficulty. Intervention perhaps takes place too late, when a country has gone past the point where liberal reform or external funding or moral encouragement are going to have a lasting effect. And once the war does start, the geopolitical factors come in, Libya having a long coastline and within fairly easy distance of NATO bases in Italy was a possible case for intervention. Syria, I think, must be seen as a nightmare for military planners as far as uh, intervention is concerned. We go back, of course, to the case of Spain, where Germany and Italy uh, were intervening very directly on the part of the nationalists, and to a lesser extent, Russia on the part of the republicans. Um, and, of course, Britain and France, to their eternal discredit, um, followed a line of non-intervention and appeasement. Whether anything could have been done to stop the war, given the size of Spain, General Wellington said in the Peninsular War it was a good country to lose a whole army in. Of course, the French did just that. But um, these things have to be taken into consideration. All too often, lawlessness has emerged with militant extremist factions or a criminalized political economy where the wrong people get in charge of the resources and then you have great difficulty re-establishing an economy on which to base your society. And corruption and violence may well become endemic. When relief is sent in, it may require military cover to be able to do so. It may have to operate on the basis of fragile agreements with local factions, the so-called warlords, who actually may not have total control over the areas or the groups which they claim to command. So the question emerges as to how you can defeat militarized extremists and institute the rule of law. This may involve moderating political conflict, introducing both a political and an economic system that all sides can support. 
One difficulty, of course, is identifying. I say all sides, not both sides, because all too often the actual sides aren't entirely evident and there's jockeying for power going on on more than one side. Creating favourable conditions may involve building up working coalitions in order to run a civil administration, which in turn means creating conditions in which non-violent processes can be set up and maintained, at least until normality has returned. There needs to be a common sense of direction, not only among local factions, but also amongst the various external partners, whether these are military, financial, social, or even charitable. And planning needs to be coherent and based on proper partnerships. Mediating conflict may involve getting different groups to withdraw from areas of contention or to areas which they can control and even areas where actually they feel secure. Let's go on to the women and children. On the left-hand side, child soldiers in the Middle East. On the right, women in Nicaragua um, running from an air raid back in the time of Somoza, which was the late 1970s. These events, I'm afraid, are not necessarily contemporary. Then, of course, there's the difference between negotiation, reaching agreements, which may be backed by treaties, and with the proper backing of law, and then implementation for the long term. The area of contention might be land reform for one group, the regaining of historical territory for another, access to mineral wealth for yet another. There may not be universal buy-in with groups trying to disrupt the process with tactics ranging from stretching out negotiations needlessly through to launching bombing campaigns. Negotiations or periods of truce can be used illegitimately to regroup, rearm, or even start the battle somewhere else. Agreement may not lead to action. Some groups will feel that things have gone too far and an equal and opposite number will feel that they haven't gone far enough. Mistrust and accusations of cheating may bedevil all sides and damage the effectiveness of new structures. Power sharing could even lead to fragmentation. In Spain, between 1976 and 1978, 700 political parties were legally registered, of which about four actually had any impact in the um, elections in 78 and 1980. Even then, some groups may still feel excluded or may not wish to be included. Former allies held together by a common cause, and this has been seen recently, may fall out or revert to their own individual aims and goals. Recognition of regional rights may lead to fragmentation or even secession, and this may in turn lead to ethnic conflict. And the changes taking place may have a knock-on effect in the region, lead to interference by other states, or the withdrawal of support by major powers in the region. Equally, neighbouring countries can become involved directly or indirectly because of pressure on their borders, concern over their own stability, or the vexed issue of the mass movement of refugees desperately trying to get away from the fighting. The case of Syria and Lebanon is worth studying in this context, and I believe that Chatham House has a project on at the moment on this particular topic. But it's a problem common to many countries whose neighbours are little prepared for such an influx of people. Now, a variety of negotiating techniques have been developed in recent years in order to um, arrive at a solution which may be viewed as satisfactory by both sides. It's what Harold Wilson always used to call a package. You put in things that people do want, and in order to get those, you stick in a few things that you know that you want that they don't want, and you hope somehow that this will actually stick. The question then is how to make people accept compromise, accept a lesser deal in one area for something better in another, and then how to make it all stick. This crosses over into nation building, or rather the rebuilding of failed states with a proper system of government. I think this is a major topic facing the world in probably the next 10 to 20 years, Every time you think you've sorted out one country, another one seems to um, tip over the edge. Um, I notice in the university system that more and more degree courses seem to be emerging um, with regard to sort of management of crisis and how to get yourself out of these awful situations. And hopefully, certainly I've been very impressed with the um, reading, the transcript of these available after the lecture. Um, I was very impressed particularly with the range of books that have come out in the last 
three to five years under the generic heading of conflict resolution, looking at concrete examples and in particular looking at the agencies, the organisations which have been on the ground down at the sharp end, looking particularly at the Balkans actually over a period of 20-25 years and saying what did we get right, what did we get wrong, can we develop a blueprint for next time. And um, on the one hand, I found it very positive to see that there were so many people um, working at a very high level and coming up with very positive suggestions. But of course, it's a matter of time as to whether these may be seen as solutions, which of course we all hope will eventually be found. So nation building, rebuilding failed states, having a proper system, I mean, doesn't this sound trite? Proper system of government, proper system of law, a police force that you can trust or rely on, and always defence, because quite often these countries are in parts of the world where their own borders are unsafe, their own resources may be under threat or may be challenged historically by neighbouring states, and the other thing, of course, is a viable economy. Having got everything straight, having got it, everything sorted out, how is it actually going to be paid for? And again, in my reading, quite interested to see the debate which is emerging. There were assumptions that what you need is a modern liberal market, in brackets, I have to say it this week, Thatcherite economy, or whether there is some kind of controlled, managed, directed economy which countries need to follow, which they need to use over a period of time, which could be decades, before actually you have the resources. In so many of these countries, the infrastructure doesn't exist. You don't have your bridges, you don't have your roads, you don't have your deep water ports, you don't have your access to the sea. What are you going to base your economy on? Quite often you have natural resources, they're not accessible, or they're very expensive to extract. Or they, as in the case of Peru and Ecuador, go across an existing national boundary. Economy is a very complicated topic, but unless you can sort that out, I suspect whether that the politics would not actually be sustainable. Now, that all seems something of a tall order, but the blueprints, the templates, the enormous efforts by organisations and individuals mean that ultimately we would hope to see the emergence of stable societies where people can actually... I mean, it's a very simple goal, isn't it? People want to go around their daily lives with at least a modicum of security and comfort. They want their basic amenities to be covered, by which I mean something as basic as clean water, and something which is very, very common right the way across the world. They want a better world for their children. Now, that is a very straightforward, clear-cut ambition. How you actually get to that point is, I'm afraid, another topic. However, today we're going to look at conflict resolution from three quite contrasting angles. I'm delighted to welcome our speakers today. Simon Keyes is the director of the St. Ethelberger Centre for Reconciliation and Peace in Bishopsgate, which was, of course, virtually destroyed by an IRA bomb back in 1993, I think. Um, Sir Geoffrey Nice is a QC who worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and, in fact, led the prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic. And subsequently, he's been involved with the International Criminal Court and has dealt with a wide range of countries. And Ian Ritchie is well known as the director of the City of London Festival and has a long involvement with music and conflict resolution, taking a very personal angle on today's subject.